solitary man, a highly ranked public servant in the employ of the Queen of Ethiopia. And Philip proved to be the right person in the right place at the right time. He heard this man reading from a book. Not any old book. It was the Old Testament. Not any part of the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah. Not any chapter from the prophecy of Isaiah, but chapter 53. And Philip began with a question. Do you understand what you're reading? That was the right question. The man didn't understand. How can I, he said, unless somebody helps me? And the man said, who's Isaiah talking about here? And Philip began to tell him about Jesus. The man was converted. He was baptised and he went back to Ethiopia. Now Philip could have protested. It didn't seem like a good strategy to take a mass evangelist from a successful crusade in Samaria and send him to a desert road to talk to one man. It may have been the most strategic thing that ever happened in the ministry of Philip. How many of you can name the person who led Billy Graham to Christ? Probably fewer than a handful. How many of you can name the person who led C.H. Spurgeon to Christ? Yet each of those people went on to reap a huge harvest of souls. And who knows how Africa was impacted by the conversion of that one important official. God may say to some people in this room, arise and go, and the place may be very unattractive. It could be to some remote Aboriginal community in this country. It could be to a Muslim country where they don't want you. Where there are flies and mosquitoes and all sorts of diseases. But God wants the gospel to go to the whole world. And he has the right in his omnipotence and sovereignty to put the people whom he regards as the right people in the right place at the right time. A book called I Believe in Evangelism, written by an Anglican minister in England, evangelical, makes this statement. Opportunities come in so far as we really want them. I'm going to say that again. Opportunities come in so far as we really want them. You know, it's not hard to witness to somebody when they're reading the Bible, don't know what they're reading about and want help. It's the easiest thing in the world to witness under those circumstances. Wouldn't you agree? I don't know about you, but I don't consider myself as having the gift of evangelism, but that does not exclude me from sharing the gospel. I can't hide behind the absence of a gift any more than you can hide behind the absence of the gift of faith as an excuse for not believing or the absence of the gift of giving for not contributing to God's work. No, we're all meant to share the gospel, whether we're evangelists or not. But are we really available to share the gospel? As I think about it, I go shopping with my wife, at least she goes shopping and I sit on a bench with my iPad and my little Wi-Fi, I can do the emails and so on while I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. But I've noticed, generally speaking, that if there are th three benches and there's a man sitting on one of them and a woman sitting on the other one and the other one is free, where do I go? To the empty one. If I go to the skin clinic to have a test and there are six seats on this side of the waiting room and only one vacant one and no seats on the other side, where do I go? Over to the vacant seats. 
I'm uh, beginning to think I've been doing the wrong thing. Am I really available? Bill Hybels has written a book called Just Walk Across the Room. <laughs> it's working. My message is successful. Hey, you're not supposed to come back. You're supposed to... Okay. <laughs> That little guy again, hello. <laughs> oh, I've got your attention. The book is called Just Walk Across the Room. Where did he get that title from? Well, he was in a big function and uh, he saw an Afri Afro-American, black American, I think you're allowed to say that nowadays, you weren't supposed to, and he had a Muslim-sounding name and he heard this voice saying, I like your books. And he thought it must, he must have been speaking about somebody else. No, he was actually talking about Bill Hybels' books. So he got into conversation with this man. And he heard his story. This man was a Muslim. And he was at a, a big function, a sort of a big party. And he was used to being isolated. He was standing on his own which was quite common. And there was a group of people on the other side of the room and all of a sudden, one man left the group and he walked across the room. And he began to talk to this Muslim man. And he said he took an interest in him. And he said virtually, I don't know much about Islam. Could we have coffee so that I could sit down and have a chat with you? And they had coffee and a chat and he listened very attentively. He didn't criticise. And this happened over and over. And ultimately one night that man on, in, on his own invited Christ into his life. And that's why he enjoys Bill Hybel's books because he was a truly converted man. Because somebody walked across the room. And I want to say to some of you here today, that maybe when you get into church a little early, at 20 past nine in the morning, you should look around and see if there is not somebody sitting on his own, perhaps down in the very front seat where you don't want to sit, but you are prepared to walk across the room in order to sit down to that person who seems to be a newcomer to this church so that after the service, you can talk to him and say, let's go and have a cup of coffee, my name's so-and-so, and it might be the beginning of a chain of events which will lead to the salvation of that person. We're going to sing in a moment. Not quite a moment, so don't get excited. <laughs> We're going to sing, Here I Am, Holy Available. God isn't asking you to go to the Gaza Strip. He may be asking you to cross over this, the room and talk to a stranger. About a week ago, I was on the platform of the Nambour Railway Station. My wife and I were heading to Longreach, but the train was late. And there was a woman on the platform, obviously from another country. I went over to her and chatted. Where are you from? Vietnam. How long have you been in Australia? About 20 years. Where are you going? Going to Yudlow. I didn't know where Yudlow was. What was happening at Yudlow? It was a temple, a Buddhist temple at Yudlow. She was going to the Buddhist temple at Yudlow. What do you do? Do you back off? Do you start ranting and raving against Buddhism? She was from a Catholic family. Obviously, she'd made a change. She seems to be a seeker after truth, she hasn't found it yet. But you can tell her about truth that can be found through reading a book like the Gospel of John, which has a promise that these are written that you might have eternal life. I hope she'll read the Gospel of John and find the truth. But it requires walking across the room, sitting on the seat where somebody already is, not finding one where somebody isn't. 
Well, that was Philip. He went, and it wasn't a, goal, a wild goose chase. It was the easiest thing in the world to share about Jesus to a man whom God had set up for this engagement. Then we read about another man to whom God said, Arise and go. His name was Ananias. He used to go to a certain address, Straight Street, Damascus. And he used to talk to a man called Saul of Tarsus. And that name rings a bell. He's heard about him. He's the guy who put Stephen to death. He's the bloke who's come from Jerusalem with orders to apprehend Christians. And Ananias is a Christian. He's a disciple, it says. We never hear of him again. But he was to become the right person in the right place at the right time. He goes and he finds this blinded Saul of Tarsus no longer ranting and raving against the Christians, humbled and having been led as a little child to this address. And he's seen in a vision a man called Ananias coming and the two people meet. And Saul of Tarsus becomes the great Paul, the apostle, who planted so many ch uh, churches in the Bible lands and gave us so many books in the New Testament. And Ananias said to him, Arise and be baptised, washing away your sins and calling upon the name of the Lord. And I think that's the moment when Saul of Tarsus got converted. Not on the Damascus Road. God got his attention then. And he was converted in that encounter with Ananias. And I love the, the way his baptism and his conversion experience occurred as a single event. It's almost as if as he went under the water, he did his repenting, and as he came out of the water, he called on the, upon the name of the Lord by whom we shall be saved. And he went on to do great exploits for, for God. Not a wild goose chase, just a man who was willing to cross the street to go where God wanted him to be at the right time. Not an easy task for Ananias. It'd be like telling a Jewish rabbi to go and convert Adolf Hitler to Judaism. It'd be bad like that. But God does that. Elizabeth Elliot lost her husband to wild Alka Indians in South America. And God said to her, rise and go and preach the gospel to the people who murdered your husband. And she went. God did a wonderful work amongst them. The third person we read about was Peter. He heard these words, arise and go. He heard them as he was praying on the flat-roofed house of a building where he was staying in the city of Joppa. It was about lunchtime. He was feeling hungry. Lunch was being prepared down below. He had a few minutes before the dinner bell rang, so he spent them in prayer. A very different Peter from the one whose dearest friend had asked him to pray in an hour of tremendous stress. And all Peter could do was go to sleep. Now he's a man of prayer, and as he's praying, he sees this vision a sheet lowered from heaven with all sorts of animals which as a Jew he could never eat. And he hears the words, kill and eat. <clears throat> and being a good Jew, he protested, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God says, what I've cleansed, don't you call unclean. Just at that very moment, as he's thinking about the threefold vision that he has seen, Three men have turned up at the house in Joppa and they're asking for a man called Peter. And Peter hears, arise and go with them. 
He goes. Quite a journey to Caesarea. And he finds there a Roman centurion whose family and household are all gathered in expectancy of the arrival of Peter. And Peter shares the gospel with them. And not an individual like the Ethiopian eunuch or Saul of Tarsus, but a whole house full of people were converted to Christ even before he got to the end of his message. The Holy Spirit came upon them and the visit of Peter was shown to be so worthwhile. Each of them went. It wasn't easy for Peter. He was a true blue Jew. And to mix with Gentiles was unheard of. But he crossed that barrier. I think we need to take a leaf out of Peter's willingness to go. There's an election coming up. One of the big issues is all about the boat people. And I've got some strong feelings about the boat people, believe you me. But are they Christian feelings? There's a couple on Christmas Island who are having tremendous opportunities to cross the room and share the gospel in the languages of all these people who are arriving. And maybe, just maybe, whether we like it or not, because we are not going to the countries where these people are coming from, God, by hook or by crook, is bringing them to this country for us to love and to embrace, to talk, to have coffee with, to ask about their religion, about their culture, and share the gospel with them. Because many of them would never hear it in their own countries, as you and I know. Now, don't get political Don't have a go at me. I know the pros and cons and all of the devious things that may be going on. What has that got to do with it? Omnipotence has servants everywhere. Are we willing to be his servants? We see a woman with a burqa in a shopping centre. And it's as if it's a no-go zone. There may be no more lonely person in the whole of that shopping centre than that woman living in that cocoon. But we don't dare to talk to her. Well, I don't dare anyway, but you ladies could talk to her. Be polite. Take an interest. Listen. Be friendly. Who knows? I'm going to tell you a a story, it's a true story, and then we're going to sing those two little songs, they're prayers. Don't sing them if you're not meaning what you say. Here I am, wholly available, willing to sit next to a stranger in the shopping centre rather than with my iPad, alone. Willing to walk across the room. Willing to walk from the back seat up there to the front seat here, to be available to someone. To be the right person, in the right place, at the right time. And I can tell you, friends, if that happens, you will discover that witnessing is the easiest thing in the world when God sets up the opportunity. The real issue is, do we really want an opportunity? If I get on a plane to fly to Sydney and I bought a Reader's Digest at the newsagent, do I want to talk to anybody or would I rather read laughter is the best medicine? God can set it up. I was flying from Perth to Brisbane once and the man sitting next to me was reading a book. It wasn't Isaiah, but it was a book about people who claimed to have had death experiences and come back from the death to life. 
Now, can you see a possible way in which you could make a transition from that book to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Can you see that? You're nodding. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Here's the story, and then we're going to sing. And then we're going to have morning tea. Will you be willing to walk across the room? To leave your friends, if need be, and go to somebody's on his or her own and listen and be friendly, welcoming. They might come back next week. And the following week, they might come back as a believer. Here's the story. A book written by S.D. Gordon called Quiet Talks on Power tells of a prominent clergyman in the United States, in the state of New England. And he was invited to conduct the funeral of a young woman who had passed away suddenly. He arrived at the venue and the first person he met was the pastor of the church that the dead girl had attended. And he said, was Mary a Christian girl? And a pained look came over the pastor's face as he said, three weeks ago, I had a strong impression that I should speak to Mary and I did not and I do not know. A moment later, he met Mary's Sunday school teacher and he asked the same question, was Mary a Christian girl? And she broke down in tears. She said, two weeks ago, a voice seemed to say to me, speak to Mary. I knew what it meant, but I did not, and I do not know. A moment later, he met Mary's mother, and he thought he might be able to bring a word of comfort to her. So he said, Mary was a Christian girl. She broke down in tears. She said, one week ago, a voice said to me, speak to Mary. I intended to, but you know how quickly she passed away. And I do not know. God was saying to those three people what he said to Philip and to Ananias and to Peter. But there was no Philip there. No Ananias there. No, what's the other guy? No Peter there either. I hope the girl's salvation didn't depend upon their obedience, that in his sovereignty he found somebody who was the right person in the right place at the right time. We're going to sing now. First song is a prayer. Lead me to some soul today. We have the words? Thank you. And teach me, Lord, just what to say. Oh, we need help there. You see, some, some of us, we come blustering in. Have you heard of the four spiritual laws? No. Uh, do, you, do you understand what you're reading? What's Islam all about? Where are you headed today? Just ask question. Learn to ask questions, friends. Rebecca Manley Pippet wrote a book called Out of the Salt Shaker. And she maintains that 60% of evangelism is asking questions. Asking questions. Jesus was good at it. He was fantastic at it. Who do you think was the neighbour? What does it say in the scriptures? Whose head is on the coin here? Jews are really good at it. One man said... Why do you Jews always answer a question with a question? He said, why not? (laughs) We've got to learn to ask questions. 
that invite people to continue talking. Let's pray these two prayers from our heart. And who knows what even this next week might mean for the extension of God's kingdom. As he, in his omnipotence, places the right person in the right place at just the right time. Who knows what could come of it. I'll just play the melody and you follow the words so that we all sing from our hearts together. sung this we're going to sing here I am wholly available are we opportunities come in so far as we really want them we're going to stand and sing so let's do that ready go Go and be the right person in the right place at the right time. Into this week, Lord, we just pray that as we come across people that we will be ever mindful, Lord, of their 